Hi, uh, Lindsay Breen. I'm the CEO of Minbos. Uh, Minbos has a phosphate project in uh, Cabinda in Angola. Uh, I think last time we talked, Matt, we just signed a mineral investment contract with the government of Angola. Uh, about a week later than that, I, I flew over here to spend some time here. Told my wife I'd be here 10 weeks, ended up staying eight months because of COVID. Uh, got a lot done, uh, but the world, world, world's changed a little bit. We've had to repurpose our, our plant, but uh, flip side is, Fertiliser price is really, really high. Opportunity is bigger than it was before. Brilliant, Lindsay. Uh, good, good to see. You. Sorry, <laughs> been, you haven't been trapped in Angola. It's not that bad, uh, but you've stayed there a lot longer than you perhaps uh, wanted to. Uh, and I want to kind of get into what what that's um, allowed you to do. Because, like I say, I mean, you've sort of had to adapt and, and be a little bit agile in, in a way. But like, can we just remind people where you were? A, a, a year ago, what what you were kind of setting out to do, what the twelve months ahead looked like oh, for you? Yeah, look, a, a, a year ago we were coming over here to put in place uh, the system with the IFTC with the government. That that was a critical platform for what we want to do. We're running a program where they will create a market in smallholder farmers. Uh, the other one was just to get the project on track. You know, we had to get into Cabinda. We had to get the EPC contracts signed. We had to um, put people on the ground uh, in Cabinda and just be ready to go into production and make sure all the things here and all the logistics uh, were in play. And also we were playing around on a couple of other things. Um, you know, green ammonia was something that we were very interested in, you know, adding N, adding N to the P. Uh, and that's that's moved along quite nicely, and we're happy that we'll be able to do that. And there's also a couple of other things, and you know, we're looking at the opportunity for soil carbon, and not just the opportunity. I think soil carbon uh, becomes a critical element for what we're trying to do with the IFTC. On top of that, many things have come out of it since I was here. Uh, that I probably, if I hadn't been here for eight months, I may not have found out. So we're now talking to a couple of very large farmers about supplying phosphate probe directly to them. Um, partly because of the way the world's gone, but partly because we're there and we're available and we look like a cost-effective solution. Um, so that's where we are. We're, now I guess we get to talk about where we're going. Well, yeah, I mean, just to wrap it, so we, we're, talk, we're talking about phosphate. Um, you're, you're kind of like a closed-loop system in, in a way in the sense that there's an Angola project for Angola, so there is that. Um, and I was intrigued last time around um, trying to understand how these things get financed because African finance, there are, there are a few kind of African banks um, and institutions who will do that, but you seem to have it all tied up. We talked last time about a um, donation was the, was the word you used um, from IFTC of about 20 to 30 million just to get this thing up and running and be able to utilize their network in terms of distribution, et cetera. So can you just tell me how is that? Well, how did that all go? And, you know, how are relations that's, with them? That's all gone well. Um, we had them down here last year and ran a colloquium in August. And uh, that resulted in us engaging directly with the president's office uh, regarding how the IFDC should come here and become involved. Uh, we had them down here again a month ago, uh, and again meeting with the Ministry of Agriculture and other, other relevant parties. And we put forward a, what we call an Angolan Farm Fertiliser Productivity Program, and uh, that MOU between the government and uh, and the IFDC will be submitted to the government next week. And that outlines what we're doing in terms of hectares, in terms of farmers, in terms of fertiliser that we're trying to hit over the next 10 years. So that that's really quite important. One of the things that's changed a lot since I talked to you last time was uh, IFDC had thought that they would utilise, you know, like a subsidy structure and, and they had really good systems for putting vouchers in place to make sure that the subsidy ended up in the hand of the person who deserved it rather than the hand of the person who was ripping the bags and taking them across the border. So, but having been here and, and worked out what was going on in Angola and how far they were down the track of what an IFDC program would do, they decided that they probably prefer to come in with something like a, a credit guarantee facility to come in behind large agro deals or fertiliser suppliers, which sort of uh, plugs the gap because what they really do is close the loop. You know, you've got your farmers, they need to have knowledge about their soil, they need to have knowledge about their crops, they need to have knowledge about their practices, then they need the inputs, they need the fertilisers, the chemicals, uh, you know, mechanic mechanisation sometimes. 
then you get your soil and your crop. Once you've got your soil and crop, you've still got to get it to market. So there's a link there between financing the farmer into his inputs and then getting his outputs out. And it turns out Angola's made a lot of steps with some large groups here and some financing by the IFC. So a credit guarantee facility coming in behind uh, some of the bigger agro dealers will get huge leverage um, to actually finance the farmers and then the, the agro dealer will recover out of the product. Of the end. There's, a, there's a number of really interesting projects here that will help with that. So that's changed a lot in the last year and that's definitely where we're heading. Well, it has changed because you know, you know, that's that's a very different sort of structure to the one we discussed. And, and is that a case of IFDC actually learning about how to do business in Angola? And 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 what bearing did that have on the fact that you needed to raise money in December? Like when near was it nearly six million no, last December? December? Was- because you, again, you know, it was one of the things you said to me was that we we probably won't need to raise money. That was in no, May. December was time. Uh, December was COVID. We we run out of, you know, things have just taken a lot longer. Uh, you know, the reason I'd stayed in Angola was because I was here for eight months because it would took, every time I went home to Australia, it was going to take a month out of my life. So, and that was indicative of what happened in the world last year. So we just ran out of time to get our DFS done and, and finalise the thing with the IPC. So we needed to take some more time on that. Uh, and we've been trying to get a, a bulk sample across to the US to finalise the engineering details. That had also taken longer than, uh, than we'd anticipated. Um, as it turns out, that's very, very fortunate because we can now do different things with that bulk sample, which suits what we're trying to do in the current market circumstances. Right. Okay. Uh, so I would say to people listening to this, especially on podcasts, the banging in the background is, is, is not a tired woodpecker it's uh, some work that Lindsay's having done uh, in the property there um so bear with us um um focus on the content because it's this, this is good stuff we're talking about here um so Lindsay, i want to i want to talk about sort of the africa factor there right you know there's um let, let's do things now and let's do things now now mean <laughs> are very different in Africa. So, <laughs> well, they're definitely working now. Now, um, but you know what I mean. When when pe- things don't move as quickly as you want all, all the time, and I know you kind of factor that in, and and, and obviously COVID did have a big impact um, with you, and you've raised raised the money to kind of give you that that breathing room. But um, with the IFC government, etc., you know. Uh, how how are relations in terms of um, their kind of commitment to making this happen now? Because you're, you're at that point where you've kind of got final design complete for the uh, Cabinda phosphate um, fertilizer plant, right? So you, 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 that's good news. Um, but it, yeah. it, what else is going to hold you up? What else could hold you up? No, I don't think I don't think we'll be held up. Uh, there'll be a perception that we're being held up, but not being held up. So with the government, you know, there's a number of number of things that they have in place that will help. Uh, for example, with importation here, they have a mechanism that if, if you're replacing importation, because Angola is a strongly importing country due to its historical circumstances, if you're um, replacing something that's imported, uh, then you get quite a lot of protection um, to, to the extent that if somebody can use your product, they, they pretty much have to use your product. So it's not, a, not totally a take or pay, but it's definitely a take. And given what's happening in the sector, we know that people are out there trying to, you know, trying to apply lots of fertilizer to develop these to develop these sectors and in the current market you just can't get it you know you're, you're lucky to get kilograms let alone tons uh you know thousands thousands of tons in, in twain gold and this will probably hang around for a year or two so we're in a pretty good position and the government realizes you know that agriculture is a big way of diversifying their economy and there's a lot of support come into it in the last Five years, and there's more, and there's more coming. Not not just for us, but for other parties as well. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I'd like. I, I guess we'll 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 see how you move move through the the phases there, as, as it were. But it, I guess some of the some the supporting components of what you've just said would be. Um, and I think we maybe touched on it a little bit last time. I can't remember if it was on camera, or off camera, around the kind of green ammonia um, uh, aspect to to this. I mean, what was? Can you give us an update? Yes. So we identified that Angola have uh, a surplus of hydroelectric power, um, probably a thousand megawatts of hydroelectric power that's already installed that they don't utilise. And we, being in the fertiliser business, thought, well, here's a great opportunity to make nitrogen, nitrogen fertiliser. And if you look up power prices, you know, Angola's 
Angol's power price, I think, is the cheapest or second cheapest in the world, you know, like one and a half or 1.7 cents per kilowatt hour for industrial users. So, for example, my house here, uh, as a tenant, there's, there's, no, there's no power meter. Um, I, I, don't pay a, I don't pay a power bill here because I think, in, you know, residential tenants pay you know, residential property. I think it's just over two cents a kilowatt hour. And I think it comes as a fixed cost. I'm not sure they even, they even meter it. So the, the power is available and it's the hydro. The hydro dams are right out in the middle of where the agricultural areas are being developed. So from where we've been allocated land for our project is next to a 26,000 hectare sugar farm that didn't exist 10 years ago. And then by 2027, it'll be 38,500 hectares. Uh, there are other people looking out there to do 12,000 hectares of sugar. There's already people doing 7,000 a May and soy. So this, this area, huge agricultural potential, needs nitrogen, also needs phos uh, phosphate. But we've got the potential to do what we call local for local. Uh, so by doing something almost identical to what Zimbabwe did with Sable Chemicals back in 1972, they did it on the Kariba Dam. Uh, Kariba had heaps and heaps of surplus hydro. And if you look at the yields in Zimbabwe in 1970 and compare them to 1976, some crops actually started yielding 10 times as much. Certainly other crops are using yielding double. And a lot of what is ascribed to Zimbabwe becoming the breadbasket of Africa and the Green Revolution was just straight down to that nitrogen plant getting built and having nitrogen available in Zimbabwe. So we get to do almost exactly the same thing here in Angola. Okay, that, that, I think that's interesting. Um, it, there's there's no real kind of cost to you, or it, it, well, is there? I mean, how do you engage with that? Is it? Ju it's just the fact that it's just there. There's a, there's a lot of green ammonia stories that are out there, and they require people to build wind, or they require people to build solar and put it in place. I can build this right next to a dam that's already there, already with a substation and the water goes down the river instead of getting transported out as electricity because the, the market and the connection to the, the market is not there. So that, you know, if I could if I could put a plug into it and start that plant tomorrow, the, that power is already available. So that's a that's a huge plus. Huge, huge plus. Okay, so, so let's come back to let's come back to the plant. Okay, does de de designs there. How does this thing get financed? How long does it take to well, and you know, and what are the hurdles in terms of permits or licenses that that you additional permits licenses that you may need? We're a little, a little, just a just just a little way away from uh, signing off on this. But the, right. the what we propose is we would we would do we would take a, uh, some months um, to do a market evaluation study because if you if you make green ammonia, you know, let's just call it ammonia. You know, ammonia is the base chemical for pretty much all nitrogen fertilizers. So you've got a all, all, straight away you've got a choice of six or seven nitrogen fertilizers that you can make with uh, make the ammonia. You know, so you could make ammonium nitrate, you can make uh, calcium ammonium nitrate, calcium nitrate, aqueous ammonia. So the, the the crops, the climates, the soils, what's happening will dictate what that is. And we just want to get a feel for what that market is. The, the most likely will be ammonium nitrate or calcium ammonium nitrate. And there are calcium deposits, you know, limestone deposits around that we can do that. We, we, we can do that with. But the key is, you know, if I'm competing with somebody that's bringing ammonia in, say from Nigeria, they've got to ship it across the ocean, they've got to put it through the port, and then they're going to put 400 k's in land to the, to the farm. That's probably worth $100 a tonne straight, straight away there. If you're looking at, you know, if you just take their tariff rate of one and a half cents a kilowatt hour, that's equivalent to $4 a gigajoule in gas. Um, so we, we're obviously asking for a discount on that in the early stages so that we're competitive, so with two dollar gas, which is when we initiated this, but you know, as you know, gas in Europe is now thirty dollars and gas in the US is seven dollars. So I think it puts Angola in a really, really strong position is that it's going to be impossible for anybody to drive ammonia past that plant at a, <laughs> at a, at a cheap price. So if they're trying to develop an agricultural sector, Massive advantage for them. Okay, I, I get that you're going to try and work out the the economics, and you'll with the DFS people are going to firm up on that. And in an ever changing market, in terms of energy pricing, broadly uh, in, inflationary factors, um, supply chain issues. But you, you, like I said, you're kind of you've kind of got a, in a way a, a captive audience. It's high grade stuff that you, you've got. It's 
it sounds like it's going to be high margin. It should be all good news for you. But I've got, I've got to come back to the question about how does this thing move forward? You are a whatever, it's eighty million dollar company, yeah. right? First thing we'll do, we'll put that away and we'll get the phosphate up and running because the phosphate's a, a, a much smaller capital event, and will give us um, right. cash flow, and that'll to grow for that'll continue to grow for ten years. Um, looking forward, there's possibly synergies between the phosphate and, and the nitrogen. They don't actually have to remain separate nutrients. There, there, there is a couple of ways that they can they, they can work together, which we, we will really investigate. On the nitrogen, there's no shortage of people who would like to be partners on that. Um, you know, as in, in terms of users, uh, you know, technology suppliers. There's a lot of people out there in engineering land, licensing land, uh, offtake land who want to be involved and want to be at the front of green ammonia because they see that this is where the world's going. And you know, so they, they don't want to be left behind if they're a market leader in existing ammonia facilities. They want to be a market leader in green ammonia as it becomes a normal part of the market. So there's, uh, I'm finding a lot, a lot easier to attract potential suitors to that than uh, to a small phosphate project up in Cabinda. Let's answer the question then. It's like, what, what, that, that, that's people you could be talking to. So come back to what what do we think it's going to cost for an eighty million dollar company? What's going to cost broadly? Uh, okay, what do so you think? What, what, what type of money do you think this is going to be? Is What's it going to cost? Is, right. I, I come back to the IFTC, uh, you know, learning, uh, which is like it's not easy to kind of uh, predict. What's going on, especially with the market changing, et cetera. So, you know, has your thinking evolved? Because obviously the way you're approaching it seems to evolve since we've last spoken as well. No, no. So exactly right. So I think I think I think the phosphate's actually in some ways got a, a lot easier because it's, it's it's sort of moved two or three steps further towards just the market than to having IFTC. Well, IFT still will still bring their own money to fund their own programs, by the way. Okay. But in terms of the green ammonia, if I if I understand your question, what's that going to cost? That'll that'll be in you know hundreds of millions you know in the three three to four hundred million dollar range, um, and but I think there'll be off takers uh, and an opportunity for joint venture partners to come into that because it, one one will be competitive, two will be zero carbon, uh, and people will people will be interested people will be interested in that in, in the market. Right. You used a phrase. You used a phrase earlier, which which kind of I'm not quite sure what to think. We say like you you you're going to kind of work out work. So what was the phrase precisely? You're trying to work out what the market is in terms of what you, whether you go the nitrogen route, the phosphate route, what the balance should be, timing, and all of that kind uh, of stuff. What what, what uh, did you mean? So I'm, probably, I'm probably confused you there. Yeah. So nitro, when you make not when you make ammonia, you can then. You've got a choice of seven or eight nitrogen fertilizer products. Okay, right. One of those could involve phosphate. Okay, so that that is a possibility. But in terms of just making a nitrogen fertilizer, there's there's, there's a choice that has to be made, and that'll be dictated to by the crops, the soils, and the climates that are there. So that will immediately discount some. So as I said, the most likely are ammonium nitrate and probably calcium ammonium nitrate. So that's the decision that I have to make there. That's not a that's whichever way you go. That's not a big step on from ammonia. Uh, you know, that's just an add-on. But why is that not a known if known factor? Why 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 the variance? Why why could it be one thing or the okay, other? Okay, so ammonium nitrate is not a, it, 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 so ammonium nitrate would probably be the preferred fertilizer. But some countries don't like ammonium nitrate because of the security risk. So that, that will be the, that will be the question that plays out here. Calcium ammonium nitrate has a slightly lower uh, nitrate content and also has calcium, um, which can be an advantage. So, so some crops don't want as much calcium, but if you want to grow co cotton, which there are people that are getting quite keen to grow cotton here, it was a large cotton grower in the past. Then calcium and nitrogen are going together is actually a good, is, is, is a good solution. So that will be the playoff. Do I want a higher grade nitrogen fertilizer or? With, with, with a bit of a security risk, or I want to take calcium nitrate. So there's a few other factors that will play into that as well. But that that's you know they're the things that we have to consider, and now we'll have to engage with stakeholders on that. Okay, okay, and and just on on, on the kind of well, similar vein, it's like you started ordering plant parts last year, right? For you the can, phosphate, for the yeah. phosphate, yeah. You kind of getting 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 ahead of things. 
um, DFS to 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 be delivered, right? Um, you know broadly what, what what you want to do there. Is has has anything changed there? Is there still any uncertainty with how you come at that? Given no, that you right, okay. Yeah. And how does that affect the stuff that you've ordered? Because surely that stuff will be ordered to you know produce a certain specific product. So um, the good thing about the kit that we bought is it's very flexible. So it can turn its hand to a few things. So we can use it for granulation. Uh, we can use it just for some beneficiation and maybe some coating of you know secret herbs and spices. Uh, and indeed, we can turn that plant if we really needed to, um, without much without much change into a partial acidulation plant. So it has it has a lot of flexibility in it, and I always knew that it had that flexibility in it, which is why we were prepared to take the risk for early. What we didn't realise is we'd have to repurpose it before we'd even built it, <laughs> because the market changed so much. And if I may backtrack on that, we put a scoping study out in 2020 that you know when when we bid for this project. MAP price, you know, monomonium phosphate uh, was $258. Uh, we did a scoping study at $428 with a high and a low range. We used the 90th percentile for the last dec decade and it was $600. Today it's $1,200. You know, it's double the 90th percentile price for the last decade. This is a Mr. Massive move. More importantly, the gap between phosphate rock price and the water soluble price is that it was $200. It's now $1,000. So where phosphate rock, so to use sort of like a crude phosphate rock based fertilizer didn't make a lot of sense in the past because you just pay an extra $200 and you get a fully water soluble phosphate fertilizer. Now you have to pay $1,000. And also it's very, very difficult to purchase. If you're in a small market like Angola, it's actually difficult to get that supply, you know, like get the map for the blend uh, at, at all. And, and I think we're going to see that be a struggle for several years. And it's not it's not the war. It's, you know, the war has put the, you know, sort of, added a little bit to it but ammonia plants in europe were being shut down last year you know they were being shut down last year now ammonia is made usually made from gas you know gas in the us and europe were dollar 60 you know you know within the last 18 months europe's now 30 dollars us is seven dollars and and i i think that uh, uh will close if you know the world's energy in the last in the last decade has gone up by I think 20 terawatt hours, of which gas has contributed half. Almost half of that has come from gas because as we've gone into energy transition, people are moving away from coal, and so gas has had to take up a lot more of the market growth. And then you know renewables have probably contributed you know 30 or 25, 30 percent of that. But gas has been has shouldered the heavy lifting on filling the gap on energy growth. Ammonia is sort of like only a small part of the gas market. So now it's like it's, had, it's having to wear what's going on in the energy sector. Um, and so you, you, you just can't get hold of it. And every dollar a gigajoule is approximately $40 a tonne on, on your ammonia. So a product that was selling for $300 a tonne not long ago, if your price goes from, you know, $3 a gigajoule to $30 a gigajoule, you, you, you've just added eight or nine hundred dollars a tonne in feedstocks to it. And until that gas price can come down, that's a massive problem for ammonia-based fertilizers, which is nitrogen. But what a lot of people don't understand is the vast majority of phosphate fertilizers are monammonium phosphate and diammonium phosphate. So they need to have ammonia to be produced as well. So this whole gas situation is flowing through into the phosphate and the nitrogen sector. The war clearly is it's influencing potassium because Belarus and Russia are big, big suppliers of potassium. And that, it's having an impact on ammonia as well. But the real root cause of what's going on in nitrogen and phosphate fertilizers is what's happening in the, in the, in the gas markets and we've just not invested in gas upstream for maybe a decade and even now the response that's coming from the us is looks like it's coming from development of wells that were drilled before you know it's not it's not new licenses being granted new pipelines being built new fields being developed so it, it's just possibly a short-term flush and i think you know we could see a spike, a further spike in gas prices in the US and close that bar. You know, you know, 10 years ago, the US didn't export gas. 
Now it's the largest exporter of gas in the world. And so you, you see, you'll see this arc between European gas and, 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 and US gas close. And this is something I think that's not fully appreciated between the difference in the, the fertiliser boom in 2008 and the fertiliser boom now is we've got a, a serious, serious constraint on the input side, um, whereas last time it was more demand pull. Um, you know, we had a little bit of infrastructure and then we built some more infrastructure and the price went down when we had a bit more capacity than we really needed. But now we've got a real problem with gas um, and the availability of gas, which right. is okay. I'm also very keen on green ammonia because it means I can make ammonia without using gas. Absolutely right. So, and, and, and I get that, but I, so I just want to I just want to kind of close off a, a few questions here. So, obviously, costs with phosphate, sulfur, potash, ammonia, so it, going up, it it helps you, and and it, it can be a problem as well in in, in a funny sort of a way. I'm, I'm more interested in in I get the, I get the, the macro, and thank you for filling us in there. But I'm more interested in how you move this forward because you, you use a phrase in the recent press release: you you can get the DFS finished in three months. So does that mean you will get yeah, it finished? So right, the, okay. And, 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 and if so, how, how has it slightly, how, what's the, what are the elements which have ch will change that from there, from the from the feasibility study, in terms of you say the way that yeah. you're looking at the project? So let's take it first from the, the capital side, the investment side. So from the equipment, the, the plant is a, is a, it's a crusher, it's a granulator, it's a dryer, it's a screening unit. From the screening unit, it recycles back into the granulator. Um, anything that comes out of the screen of product size goes into a cooler in the bagging plant. The, the, the crusher, the, the front end and the back end are, are designed at 20 tonnes per hour. Because we have a three tonne an hour, uh, a three to one recycle ratio, everything in the middle is designed at around about 80 tonnes an hour. If we want to just beneficiate, so if we don't want to granulate, we just don't put in the binder and the granulated material. And then, the, and the, and the, then the, the granulator basically becomes a conveyor belt, and we can we can size and uh, dry the phosphate rock, bag the phosphate rock, and it, and in the cooler we can add some. It's very easy to put some coating sprays and add some secret purpose spices, which I think will will help the phosphate rock and make it a, a, a you know it, it will enhance it a little bit. And and why does that make sense? Is because of the pricing differentials a thousand dollars now rather than two hundred. If the pricing differential goes back to two hundred dollars, then it makes sense to go back to the other way and look at other options. Um, and also, the same plant without a lot of jigging could probably be used to do partially acidulated phosphate rock, which then gives you some more soluble product. So we, we really have three options with the same plant. So the capex on the plant, I think we're going to have to spend. We're going to have to buy a second burner for the dryer because the dryer is too big. We'll probably blind off one of the screens and remove one of the screens. And if we want to shift from one campaign to the other campaign, it'll probably take us a 24 hour shutdown to shift from one back to the other. So from the CapEx side, it doesn't change very much. But what's the Only number? Next, what's the number? It doesn't change, but I don't know what it's, what is yeah, that? We haven't number? published the number yet, but okay. it's going to have a four in front of it. Okay. <laughs> it, won't be, it won't be a 30 number, it'll be a 40 number. Okay. So, um, and we've got a fair bit of option to pull things out, you know, little superfluous things. Okay, now you can't give me, but okay, well, here's what we In terms of, obviously, you've gone, the difference is 200, it's gone to 1,000. It's like, how much of that are you capturing? You know, price, price changes are one thing, um, but if you're not yeah. capturing any of the gains, that's another, because I know costs have gone up. Um, you're not that far away from the DFS. Is, do, do you think this, not re engineered, but this new thinking, Will allow you to put out economics which is significantly similar to the feasibility study, or will they be improved? So coming back to the scoping study, I think I think we'll be able to maintain something that, 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 that's similar because okay, you know, phosphate rock was eighty dollars two years ago. It's now three hundred dollars for 33 percent phosphate rock. Um, and if you want to get it from somewhere in land and Angola, it's going to be at least three hundred dollars um, to to get it there. Our costings are probably going to go down. To a, We'll need less gas and less water, and you know, no binder. Obviously, we won't need to buy any map. And you know, map had gone from being forty percent of the cost of our product to eighty or ninety percent of the cost of the product. So, I, I, I think we'll be able to capture that. And then there's uh, and there's a, there's a chance that we can actually get up to our full production capacity faster because. Uh, when you're using a product like this, rather than putting it on like a water soluble phosphate at 50 kilograms per hectare, 
there's an opportunity to do what they call a capital investment in phosphate fertiliser, very similar to what happened in Western Australia in the, uh, you know, the, with the superphosphate bounty, what goes on in the Cerrado now. When you're opening up new land, it makes good sense to put a lot of phosphate on really, really early. So we might end up with application rates that, you know, are several hundred kilograms rather than, you know, 50 kilograms, which will help us sort of get up to our capacity a little bit earlier. So already, you know, a couple of the larger customers are talking to us about rates like this uh, in, 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 in their areas. And we think the same thing can apply into the smallholder farmers as well. Okay. So the bit, the bit I heard though was that the numbers will be broadly the same as the previous scoping study. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm living and breathing this and I'm talking it, uh, but I, I, you know, if I'm going, uh, if I'm going in too hard and confusing the hell out of you and your, and your no, 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 it's not, it's not, it's not that, Lindsay. It's, it's like I, I'm telling you, the only thing that people are getting, the, the detail is fine for people who want the detail, but what they want to understand because of one, you've had to raise money we didn't expect to, to, to the sort of slight delay to the feasibility, definitive feasibility study. It's like they want to hear you are the numbers have not been affected. You're going to be able to take advantage of the improved pricing in the marketplace despite inflationary yeah. pressures, supply chain issues, and other delays, and the fact that you had to sort of slightly um, adapt, and the fact that you know the the market is there's still a few unknowns in, in the marketplace, right? So if the numbers are the same, I think that is is cause for celebration. Uh, despite the headwinds that you face with COVID, et cetera, okay? So that that's all I was trying to get from you. I think, look, the numbers will come out in the, in the DFS. There's one or two little things to go out there. But, you know, if, if I can look at this deposit, this deposit's very, very, you know, it's a, it's a low-cost plant. We've got 7 million tonnes of phosphate rock at 30%, and the value of that phosphate rock's just gone up $200 a tonne. You know, uh, you know this, this is good news. Now, the fact that we've had the flex to adapt to the market, that's great. We, we we put the flexibility in there. And if we have to flex when the market changes again, we can do that again. So, you know, sure, we'll, 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 we'll have to hammer in a few little details over the next few months, but that's a simple thing. Seven million tonnes of phosphate rock that's gone up by $200 a tonne in the last 12 months. As of costs, right? So that, that's the point. I just want to make sure we, we understood. Well, our capital costs, I don't think I've sent them up in the last six months because we ordered a year ago. So, you know, we took that ballsy bet and my board backed me in and we ordered that a year ago. And on the operating cost, I said, well, we'll, we'll use less gas and we'll use a few more other things. So our operating costs are probably not going to get hurt that much. Either. Okay. Timing for definitive feasibility study is was what? You can do it in three months. When, when will we see it? Yeah, we should we should be able to see it in July, I think. So we've got a, we've got a, a pilot plan trial that we're going to run which was going to run on granules and now we're running on sort of this new 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 production model. So we've got a call on Monday to work that out with the IGC on how we run that through and, and just make sure we nail down the timing on that. That's probably the only uncertain timing, but we should be able to get most of those numbers out um, by July. And is that bulk well that's a bulk sampling um is that broadly what you thought it was? Pilot plant, pilot plant test. So they they've got probably the best pilot plant facility in the world. Okay. And we shipped over sixteen tons. Um, and we'll probably run about eight tonnes through that, which will give us about eight tonnes worth of product to do some fairly, okay. serious, fairly serious demonstration trials here later this year as well. Okay, good, good, good news. And then was DFS out, trials done, the, the again, timing for, well, timing for the funding process. I, I assume you're speaking, you, you, you see, right, like you speak so to some people. Uh, funding, fund, funding, um, We'll, we'll clearly fund equity and we've got people that are still interested in the debt. Changing our business model at this late date doesn't help when you're uh, when you're approaching your debt. So we'll, we'll have to play some tunes on how we do that with the debt and the equity. But also there's, you know, we've had some meetings with some DFIs that are uh, very interested in what we're trying to do, both in a you know, fundamental in terms of payback, but also in what we're trying to do with small public farms. So, there is interest out there, uh, and us having to delay our DFS is, it will, will cause problems there with timing timing on that. Um, but I think we should be okay for getting funded. Okay, okay. Well, I, I, I guess we'll wait for that to roll out. Um, the other thing you've done is you, you, you've resolved the Madagascar rare earth uh, yeah. component. 
Next slide. When we, when we took that on, uh, we just lost the project here. You know, uh, you know, we, when we needed we needed a project, and rare earth was good, and we had some rare earth expertise in the company. Uh, what we liked about it was a was bastinite mineralisation, and there's a lot of plants in China that are designed to eat bastinite, and they've got less and less to eat. Uh, so they can get hold of as much monazite as they like to make rare earths, but not so much bastinite. Um, so the, the the guys that are buying it are from China, and that's exactly their interest. We drilled out what we thought was the target when we came in, and it wasn't it wasn't the target that we were led to believe. And then we reached with a very good joint venture partner and said, "Well, why don't we?" It looks like there's a lot more to the north. And we did that, so we did a lot of geophysics and orbit drilling and soil sampling. So. We sort of killed the target that we started on, and then made the target a lot, lot bigger. Um, so, so, and I think uh, you know, got some really nice grades, um, but you know, not not enough to sort of wrap tons around it. So, these these guys were interested in it, and I think it fits. I think it'll be a much better project for them than it was for us. Um, and we're hoping that that will settle in the next couple of months. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, let's say good update. Um, like I say, it th- th- this industry. I, I'm more interested in. I know there's always going to be bumps along the road. I'm more interested in how the, the management teams deal with them and take advantage of them and, and, and um, overcome, et cetera. So look, uh, um, thank you for running through where you're at. Sounds like it's pretty darn close. Sounds like the DFS is going to be a, a, a big moment for you in terms of helping people understand how, you know, where, where you're at with the numbers, the economics of, of this, um, despite the ever-changing environment that, that, that you're operating in. So like, um, Stay in touch. I want to see you more often than once a year. So yeah, let us know when that comes out and let's have a chat. We'll do that. We'll, hopefully we'll have some news on the green ammonia soon. Um, and, you know, if 7 million tonnes of phosphate rocks gone up by $200, um, you know, gas going up $7 to $7 a gigajoule or higher um, adds value to that uh, hydroelectric uh, concession as well. So, yeah, the opportunity has got much bigger here in Angola and the opportunity has always been Angola. It is, it is much bigger. So yeah, I should come back and talk to you more often. I've got plenty to talk about. There will be more.